Hallo dann, wir dürfen das Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, liebe Freunde. I'm Alfred Sauter, the director of the Goethe Institute here in Slovenia, and it's my great, great pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to our discussion, Europe, still a continent of immigration. Thank you all very, very much for coming and for being here. It's a lovely evening out there, and we do appreciate your presence a lot. Now, we all remember a slogan we heard not so long ago from the Brexiteers in the UK, take back control. This slogan certainly also was about stopping unwanted immigration to Great Britain, and it certainly was intended as a clear, clear signal to the rest of the world, and especially to Europe. We want to push back everyone and we'll do whatever it takes if needed. And very similarly, during one of my last assignments down under in Australia, there was a gentleman called Tony Abbott. And I watched him winning an entire election campaign with one sentence consisting of five words. Does anyone know these five words you can win an election with? Something with the boats, very true, very Stop true. The boats. I'm so glad we have a very informed diplomat among us. We will stop the boats. That was enough. Honest, honestly, I've heard this sentence at least 10,000 times during my stay in Sydney. And it was meant to describe human trafficking, but it was also clearly meant push back. We don't want you, and we will do whatever it takes should it be needed. Needless to say, Europe today is pretty much divided over this crucial question, the underlying question of everything. Has Europe already turned into a fortress now? Can or even should it be one? And what should the future of Europe actually look like regarding immigration and migration? Tonight, we are so fortunate to have exquisite speakers and experts among us. My dear old friend, Professor Volker Heinz, from the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities, Kulturwissenschaftliches Institut in Essen, and the Academy in Exile, he's with us. He's published widely since we first met in Canada. We both studied the migration system and the point system over there. We haven't gotten anything similar in Germany yet. And he has published widely on critical theory, the Frankfurt School, and many, many, many interesting research areas. From time to time, he sends me an article, and I'm always flabbergasted at the sheer productivity <laughs> and, and the great spirit of mind. Right next to him, Veronica Byte is with us from the Peace Institute, the Friesens Institute in Ljubljana. It's an honor. It's the first time we meet, and I'm really, really honored here to be with us on this panel. Thank you so much, so much for making us, and thank you for traveling all the way in a beautiful, brand new Tesla, I hear. <laughs> That's not relevant, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> Relax. This is so true. This is not about climate change, but it all blends <laughs> into one big scenario and one big context. And, and the moderator tonight, our master of ceremonies, is a TV star, very, very <laughs> famous in Slovenia and beyond, and beyond, Mr. Igor Tergant. He will be our moderator tonight. And now, before I hand over to my dear friend Jens Wagner, the cultural attaché of the German embassy in Ljubljana, I would like to add, this is not a standalone event at all, not at all. We always, we always plan our events in, in a context and uh, it's always happening in a series of a number of events. And while we are here at the Culture and Congress Cent uh, Center, uh, Sankriyev Dom, there's a beautiful exhibition about the legacy of humanism in Europe. And I urge you, go and see it. It's for free, no tickets asked. The entrance is for free, and you'll even get a digital catalog, and it's also for free. And it's really, it's a treasure box, and it's really worth worthwhile seeing. The uh, show is on display on the until September the 5th, before it will travel to the Faculty of Arts 
at the uh, University of Ljubljana. We are grateful for this collaboration with the City Hall, with the City Museum, the um, Kulturwissenschaftliches Institute in Essen, the Peace Institute, the German Embassy, and and all our guests uh, who work steadily with us and who follow us and uh, come to our events. This promises to be um, a major and very inspiring evening. Thank you all very much again, and enjoy. And now the floor is yours, Lieber Jens. Dear Arpad, Professor Heinz, Eric Halbeit, Igor, distinguished guests, who should be allowed to migrate to our country? Two groups, those we need and those who need us. This rather simplistic answer was given 30 years ago by Walter Bader. Now, if none of you knows who Walter Bader is, don't worry, you are not expected to know he was my history teacher in high school. <laughs> and probably he stole the quote. I don't know where he stole it from, so probably he's not the original source of this uh, quote, but still, it's the person who gave that quote to me. And this rather simplistic answer already shows the two sides of the debate on migration. The rather pragmatic side, who we need, and the moral side, closely connected to questions of humanism, who needs us. Now, the pragmatic side, who do we need? is answered in Germany at least by, I would say, the answer more and more people. It is very clear that because of demographic changes, Germany needs more, not less migration. And these trends, I predict, will continue despite some forecasts that through technological changes, artificial intelligence in the future, we will need less labor. Well, we've seen similar predictions previous waves of new technology, they all proved wrong. And I would forecast that, quite to the contrary, this trend will even accelerate further. We all, if we are seated here in this room today, we have the chance, if we eat healthy and do sports, to live to a very historic, unprecedented moment. Probably about 30 years from now, humanity will reach a point where the number of people on this planet is on the top, higher than ever before in history, and then it will start going down again. Unprecedented moment with huge implications. Probably three decades from now, Africa will be the last continent with a growing population. And therefore, I predict that to a big degree, in a few decades, maybe even in a few years, the wealth of our nations, of this continent, of Europe altogether, will depend on the question, are we able to be welcoming to young people, young talents from around the world? Do we attract young talents? That's one part of the pragmatic side. Of course, some people ask then, what happens if these young people move away from their home country? The brain drain. Well, there seems to be more and more evidence that what was feared as brain drain is less of a problem than previously thought. Economists have a wide variety of theories to explain why free trade tends to be good for all participating countries, Ricardo's law. And this seems to be true not only for products like cars or plum brandy, but also for labor. And why shouldn't it? If we think about it, isn't it best for all, for humanity, if an IT expert, for example, lives in Stuttgart instead of his home country, Syria, and is alive and employed, maybe has a chance to support from the distance his home country, relatives there? Isn't it better for an engineer to make money in Toronto than to be unemployed in Sarajevo? All this, the pragmatic side of the migration debate. And then, of course, there is the moral side of this debate. 
which right about them, my teacher in high school, <laughs> summarized with those who need us. Well, why did he discuss that with us 30 years ago? Because even 30 years ago, it was a huge discussion in Germany. Who should be allowed in? Because we then saw a wave of migrants then from, from Yugoslavia, from the wars of Yugoslavia. Admittedly, not so much from Slovenia, because Slovenia luckily had a very short war of independence, but from places just a few hundred kilometers away from here. So if we discuss refugee issues, Let's face it, 30 years ago, the big wave of migration in Europe came from Yugoslavia. And 80 years ago, the big wave of migration of refugees came from Germany and from territories occupied by Nazi Germany. So in the end of the day, the fact that we are sitting here today in this beautiful museum discussing migration and not sitting in a refugee camp, we owe mostly to luck. If he would have been born a few hundred kilometers away, if he would have been born a few decades earlier, he might well be sitting in that refugee camp. Thank you so much, and I wish you all an inspiring discussion. to be here tonight and um, I want to start my short presentation <coughs> with um, a glimpse into the life story of a typical migrant who um, traveled from what is today Poland to the industrial heartland of Germany before the First World War from Poland uh, it's, a, it's a quote I give you we are off Valentin Matzek said to me now we've got to think of our new lives I thought of the unknown land of hope we were traveling towards. According to the fat agent's promises, money grows on trees there. The train rolls through flaming Westphalia. Dortmund, Bochum, Essen, Krupp's Cannon City. Smoke, thunder, sooty barracks, the Ruhr region, the Cape of Good Hope, the Empire's Golden West." Unquote. So that's from uh, the autobiography uh, of Hans Machwitzer, who had worked as a very young man as a miner in um, Essen, where I live, partly. And then he had to flee into exile after the Nazis came to power. And later, he became a leading cultural figure in East Germany. And he wrote an almost unknown autobiography published in the late 50s, um, which I found very interesting. And this quote summarizes much of the emotional experiences of millions of migrants throughout the world. So there's always a cape of good hope, even the Ruhr region, if you go sometime back 100 years ago. And so this tells us something about the perspective of migrants. Now today we live in a very different world. The problem that many people today face is that they are denied the opportunity of migration. They are forced to stay where they are because borders are seared with radars, drones, fences, and biometric databases. And visa application offices are closed for business. If you happen to be of the wrong profile, for example, being black and poor in Africa. If the unwanted nevertheless dare to start their journey and try to cross borders into Europe, or other prosperous regions, they often risk their lives. Or to be more precise, they are deliberately exposed to harm and death by European or other authorities. Now this experience of being stuck and not moving has also been captured by numerous authors in recent times. I'll give you a quote from the novel Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits by the Moroccan writer Laila Lalani. At the center of her story are four Moroccans 
who want to cross the Strait of Gibraltar and land in Spain, their personal cave of good hope, to find what they sincerely believe will be a shining life. So one of these figures in the novel is called Murat, and that's what he says at, at one point. I quote, 14 kilometers. Murat has pondered that, num th that number hundreds of times in the last year, trying to decide whether the risk was worth it. He spends hours thinking about what he would do once he was on the other side, imagining the job, the car, the house. Other days, he could think only about the coast guards, the ice cold water, the money he'd have to borrow, and he wondered how 14 kilometers could separate not just two countries, but two universes." Unquote. Now the question I wish to ask is why borders are closed to some people and open to others. My short answer is that there's no way of answering this question without using the term racism. Certain migration routes are blocked for no good reason, but only because of irrational and exclusionary attitudes in Europe and the global north. Black and brown lives don't matter as much as white lives. That's my first claim, and I make it slightly more complicated, okay? Um, European border regimes are the expression of a hierarchical and racialized conception of mobility rights. That's, that will be my, my proposition. But how can this status quo and the enormous human costs of militarized border regimes be defended? And they are being defended every day by politicians and journalists. And I'm speaking here from the perspective of my own country, okay? So I'm not talking about other countries. And the term, the second term I want to introduce is we are facing a rhetoric a rhetorical repertoire, which I would call liberal racism. Okay, slightly oxymoronic term, and I'll explain you in a second what I mean. I think there are two main arguments or rhetorical moves made by many people. I'm not interested here in uh, right-wing radicals. I'm interested in like more like centrist positions we find in society. Mm -hmm. There are two arguments. The first goes as follows. So I'm just repeating an argument you hear all the time in Germany, France, and also the United States. So such a person would say the following. The status quo of militarized border regimes against potential migrants from the global south is justified because more open borders would politically backfire by strengthening far-right populism. Liberal immigration and asylum policies must be avoided because they will inevitably lead to anti-migrant backlashes that exacerbate the very condition those liberal policies were supposed to remedy. So that's the kind of rhetoric you hear a lot. And the person who has studied this, for those of you who at university, is Albert Hirschman. He wrote a brilliant book in the early 1990s entitled The Rhetoric of Reaction. So he's my inspiration. Uh, I think it's morally flawed, but it also doesn't get the causal story right, usually. So it's not like there's first there's immigration and then there's the right wing backlash. It's more complicated. Um, so it's true that a sudden spike in immigration often leads to anti-immigration backlashes. It's true, and Arthur, you mentioned this, Australia, other, other situa situations. But there's no automatic causality linking the two phenomena. Certainly not in the long run. The rhetoric of reaction ignores the many variables shaping the consequences of liberal immigration and asylum policies. There's no doubt that the or other migrants within a short period of time provides ample opportunities for a right-wing politics of fear. However, it is by no means assured whether a strategy of fear-mongering actually works. For example, it's true that the far-right party, Alternative for Germany, 
benefited from the refugee situation in Germany. But it's also true, if we take a longer term perspective, that other parties, for example, the Green Party and other moderate forces have been more successful. They grew disproportionately in the same time span. Now people say societies at some point reach a limit of their absorptive capacities. At some point, people would say, the boat is full, isn't it? Question is, where are those limits? Now consider a few figures about my, just speaking about my own country. According to UNHCR, HCR, Germany has now the fifth highest population of refugees in the world, with 1.7 million people having applied for asylum between 2015 and 2019. 1.7 million. So if we include 2020, we've probably reached more or less the population of Slovenia. Um, another figure, in the course of only 10 days, from the 5th to the 14th of September 2015, the famous refugee crisis, you remember, between in the course of 10 days, 67,000 asylum seekers arrived at Munich Central and were taken care of by the city and its population. By comparison, these are about six times as many refugees as the entire United, United States has resettled in the fiscal year of 2020. So that's what I call pretty, I mean, that's a lot, okay? Uh, quite, a, quite, quite a few numbers, if you choose, compare them to others. Um, but the interesting question is like, um, what happened next? And um, contrary to what the rhetoric of reaction claims, in all major German cities, which have welcomed and hosted the bulk of refugees arriving in or after 2015, Munich, Frankfurt, Cologne, Dortmund, a couple of others, the pro-migrant Green Party has become either the most popular or the second most popular party in recent local elections. At the national level, the Green also have grown disproportionately compared to the far-right alternative for Germany. We can discuss these figures afterwards. But it's interesting to, to look at these vari variables. Okay, what happens once a city takes in so many refugees? But there's more. Much of this can be generalized for almost all European countries except, let's say, Hungary, perhaps. Um, we have uh, solid survey data from 13 EU member states showing that the so-called migration crisis has not changed the overall trend towards growing acceptance of immigration over the last two decades, including immigration from outside of Europe. It's also worth emphasizing that throughout Europe, Numerous cities, Barcelona, Naples, Zurich, and yes, Ljubljana, have publicly declared their intention to become cities of refuge. So that's, that's my first point. So this connection between immigration and backlashes. So what happens once a country or a city accepts refugees and migrants in large numbers? Now this is, uh, let's turn to a second claim made by opponents of immigration in, let's say, more or less liberal democracies. So the argument goes as follows. The status quo of militarized border regimes against potential migrants from the global south is justified because more open borders would jeopardize democratic institutions by letting in people with significantly less liberal and more authoritarian attitudes who will ultimately imperil liberal democracy. Okay, so that's again, that's another uh, way of arguing from a pseudo-liberal point of view, in my view. Now, I admit that this um, thesis can be phrased as a non-racist conditional claim if a critical number of people with deeply illiberal convictions enter and settle 
in a liberal democracy, chances are that liberty is in danger. Nobody would dispute this. But there needs two, two additional conditions need, need to apply here. First, the illiberal migrants must stick to their illiberal convictions as they slowly become members of their host society. You know, they must be rigid in sticking to those convictions, perhaps even passing them on to the next generation. That's one condition. Second, they must publicly act on these, on these convictions instead of harboring them only privately or secretly, the way many Germans harbored their Nazi convictions after the end of the Second World War without being able to act on them. Now, drawing on empirical data from Germany, I give you two examples of the alleged illiberalism and democratic backwardness of migrants. Germany is, of course, somewhat of an outlier case, with the eastern half having been a dictatorship till, 18, uh, till uh, 1989, and the western part having started as a democracy without Democrats or with only a minority of convinced Democrats after the war, and being documented by historians. Still, uh, ger today Germans pride themselves of being hyper-liberal and uber-democratic, tolerant towards sexual minorities, and of course staunchly philo-Semitic. Now the downside of this democratic triumphalism is that migrants, in particular if they are black or brown, are regularly tainted for not living up to the imaginary high standards of German civilization. That is, for being intolerant, authoritarian, misogynist, and homophobic. Yet, most of these suspicions held especially against Muslim migrants are simply not borne out by the facts. For example, if only German citizens with Turkish roots had voted in the last, we have another upcoming elect, uh, election in Germany, if, if, you look, if you look at the 2017 federal elections, the Social Democratic Party, if only those people would have voted, the Social Democratic Party would have gained 35% instead of only 20%. The Green Party would have reached 13% instead of 89 and the Left Party would have attracted 16% of ballots instead of 9 And I could go on, I won't bore you with all these figures. We know that the overwhelming majority of self-confessed Muslims in Germany actively support the democratic process and votes left or center left. If we look at second generation Muslim immigrants, we have solid data on this as well, second generation Muslim immigrants or Turkish Alevi Muslims or the German Kurdish minority, the picture is even starker. Germany would be ruled by a robust center left majority and the openly racist and anti-European AFD wouldn't even exist. So against the liberal racist stereotypes, uh, Muslims in Germany are on average no less democratic than their native neighbors, and their political preferences are not fixed or set in stone by their so-called culture, but they are sub subject to generational change, which is even more important. Um, I'll give you another example. Let's look um, at the much discussed example of immigrant attitudes towards equal rights for LGBTQ persons, including the right to same-sex marriage. Germany prides itself of being really, really liberal in this respect, since five years, more or less. Because if you go 20 years, 20, 20 years back, you had a totally different country. Um, so the right to save, uh, that's just an example. You know, I could give other examples. Same-sex marriage. That's a right uh, that exists um, in Germany. For example. I think it, it exists in Slovenia. It does, by the way, not exist in many other European countries. It does not exist in Poland, Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, Slovakia. But it's a, it, we have it, and you have it, and a couple of other France, of course, the Netherlands, Ireland. Germany has legalized same-sex marriages in June 2017. If we look at the voting behavior of uh, members of the German um, uh, 
Parliament, um, we see that um, all, all members of Parliament with a Muslim background voted in favor. Okay? That's all together, it's not a lot, it's six. Six members of Parliament we know, they're Muslims, self-confessed Muslims, six in different parties. So we have 100% of Muslims in the German Parliament voting for same-sex marriage. Now this is more of a fun fact, because this could be a sheer accident, and maybe it is. Um, you could also say it's perhaps not surprising, given that Muslims in Germany, as I've pointed out, tend to vote left of center. And most uh, members of parliament making this vote, they were either Green Party, Left Party, Social Democrat. I think there's one lady in the Christian Democrat, and she voted, by the way, against the majority of, course, of Christian Democrats who voted against this legalization of same-sex marriage. Now, I, I admit readily that six individuals are, these six individuals are not fully representative of the German Muslim population in general. <laughs> the Bertelsmann Foundation has published a survey one or two years ago that shows that 81% of German Catholics and Protestants support the right to same-sex sex marriage. It's a pretty astonishing figure. So 81%, both, both the same percentage. Catholics and Protestants say yes to same-sex marriage. But only 58% of German Sunni Muslims and 69% of Shia Muslims. So that's less, okay? But 69% of um, Shia Muslims, originating from Iran, Afghanistan, it's also a pretty good figure, and it's a slightly more, sorry, I, I checked, Eurobarometer data says it's a bit more than Slovenia. <laughs> so <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but even so, Slovenia is also pretty good at 62 or something. And I could go on and on with these figures, and we can, of course, have all kinds of discussions about these figures, how, they, uh, how they're being produced. Um, but the important thing is, the world is, it's not black and white, okay? So the German survey also makes clear that attitudes towards LGBTQ persons are more liberal among Muslims who were born in Germany as compared to those who were born abroad. That's a very important figure. Mm -hmm. because people actually develop. And Germans should know. I mean, hello? 50 years ago, this was a very different country. Overall, the data show that homophobia and related attitudes are more widespread among Muslims than within other religious communities. However, the data also show that the gap between Christians or atheists on the one hand and Muslims is first widely exaggerated by conservative opinion leaders, and second, narrowing as time goes by. Wherever their parents came from, Christians and Muslims alike change their attitudes over time and tend to adopt more liberal values, according to the data I've, I've cited. Now, to conclude, Neither the argument that more open borders will automatically lead to an authoritarian backlash, nor the argument that migration from the global south or from Muslim-majority countries will jeopardize liberal standards are empirically convincing. At least not if we look at the German case. And in this presentation, I confine myself only to, the, to a country I know. Okay? Mm -hmm. If advocates of the status quo of closed borders were reasonable and open-minded, already the few empirical data I presented would give them pause. This, however, rarely happens. You know? So this is, does not impress anybody. You know? So it's all I'm talking vain to these people. And I actually, I, I can tell you, I tried. So I do have. Um, discussions with people who oppose me you know, a lot. They are not impressed by this data. The question is, I'm wrestling with, maybe you can discuss this, why is this? Why is this? Why are people not open to data or any kind of empirical reasoning? And that's, again, why this has to do with the work, with the way um, ideologies work and how prejudices shape entire personalities. That's also why I use the provocative to liberal racism. Because racism, that's the answer. It's, it's not easy to argue with these people. So liberal racists defend closed borders on the basis of a kind of effective closed-mindedness and or a secular faith. Um,
which excludes open inquiry and empirical reasoning. And none of this is new. We know this. We live in Europe, okay? So I, let's go back. That's the last person I want to quote. That's the best thing probably ever written about anti-Semitism. comes from Jean-Paul Sartre in the late 19th, written, I think, in 48 or 49, Reflections on, um, on the Jewish question. And he's very clear that there are these, in order to work, you know, you need to have these prefabricated, highly sensationalized figures of the greedy and all powerful Jew. If people have this image, there's no way of refuting their anti Semitism. Now we have the fanatical and violent Muslim the hypersexual and criminal African. You know, these are um, ideological images, highly effective images. And these images are projected onto actual persons who in the process morph into others radically different from us. Racism works exactly like anti-Semitism, which was never better described uh, than by Jean-Paul Sartre, and I, something I rediscovered only recently. And I want to uh, close with a quote from Sartre. So like anti-Semites, racists, I quote, are people who are attracted by the durability of a stone. They wish to be massive and impenetrable. They wish not to change. Where, indeed, would change take them? Only a strong emotional bias can give a lightning-like certainty. It alone can hold reason in leash. It alone can remain impervious to experience and last for a whole lifetime. I quote. Thanks for your attention, and let's discuss. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heinz. Of course, we would like also later to, to discuss uh, your book, uh, Offen the Grenzen, uh, Open Borders for All, uh, which is quite, uh, quite provocative for some people in Slovenia. Uh, some are also in the government, but, but uh, uh, we can s talk about it later. Um, but but you, you actually added um, a subtitle, uh, which is A Necessary Utopia. Uh, but uh, to give you some minutes of rest, I would like to uh, to start with with Dr. Veronica Bait, who is who is a researcher at uh, the Peace Institute in Ljubljana since 2006, educated at the University of Bristol, uh, University of Ljubljana. Uh, you also have a Master of uh, Arts degree from the Central European University in Warsaw. You, you worked. Um, in Brno at the Masaryk University, uh, so and, and you're an expert on, on migration and, and nationalism. Uh, to be as, as uh, mm, let's say, um, uh, up to date as, as possible, Europe is, if we, if we um, look at the situation and, and, and if we quote politicians, is uh, on the verge of a new um, refugee crisis from, from Afghanistan. We have today, uh, for example, the um, a very, very uh, dramatic situation in, in Poland, uh, where um, uh, where the um, uh, prime minister has declared a state of emergency because of the situation on the border to to uh, Belarus. Uh, what what Professor Heinz is actually quoting, and I would like to um, um, speak about him with that later. That, that of course there is an interesting difference uh, between some parts of Europe, uh, which which actually uh, were uh, the um, cradles of um, uh, colonialism and that they have a slightly different uh, different um, experience with, with racism and, and also mi migration and of course the let's say European East and Slovenia is somewhere in between we, we have never been um, colonists ourselves uh, with two million people it would be quite quite uh, a difficult thing but 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 do you see uh, in, in your research um, let's say a different attitude or, or a different type of, of racism and, and, um, uh, and position towards uh, migration between, let's say, uh, Europe's West and East? Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, my short answer would be actually no. 
But I will try to clarify because obviously when we look at um, the former socialist or communist states, so-called Central Eastern or Eastern Europe or the Balkans, on the one hand, um, we tend to compare them with so-called Western Europe, right, with, with the West, mm -hmm. which is um, usually um, perceived as, I don't know, either more civilized or more political if we are talking in terms of nationalism. Um, but I would argue that the thing is that they just had a lot more time to get where they are now, whereas um, post-socialist countries especially are in most cases nationalizing states still, which mm -hmm. means they are still nation building, they are still kind of um, at the same time as forming their own national identities, re-identifying, um, redefining their collective memories mm -hmm. and their ideas of self, they are already um, giving up a little bit of their sovereignty to supranational entities such as the European Union. Mm -hmm. So um, I will try to answer your question, going back to what um, Volker was saying, which is um, how the public opinion um, which I also uh, look at quite a lot because mm -hmm. I find it interesting um, that usually uh, what public opinion polls show us is that, um, and this goes for all the countries, <laughs> um, people's perception of the number of immigrants in their country is actually much, much higher than the reality. That's one thing, and that's very interesting. So if you ask, um, Polish people, German people, British people, French people, Slovenians, how many immigrants do you think are in your country? They will always give a much larger number, well, always in greater proportion. They would, they would, their idea is mm -hmm. that many more foreigners live in their country than the actual number. Now, this is especially significant for countries like um, uh, the Slovak Republic, uh, Poland, um, countries that I know that, that mm -hmm. you were refer referring to, these are countries that have very, very uh, low numbers of um, immigration, especially low numbers of asylum seekers, so mm. refugees. Um, in terms of racism, that's a broad topic, so maybe I, I come back to it. <laughs> but I would say, mm, let me try to see how I, how, how I can address this. One thing I found quite um, something I want to comment on is that whenever we use the term, you know, there's an impeding refugee crisis or mm -hmm. something along those lines, yes, th the crisis is here all the time for those people in need. Mm -hmm. We always look at those questions from our own perspective. Ooh, what are we going to do? You know, oh, poor people in Afghanistan, as long as they're on TV and far away, the minute they show up um, uh, in our news, mm -hmm. I, will not, I will not say in our doorstep, because they actually never do. But when we see them, when we hear the politicians, political figures speak in terms of what you were saying, fear-mongering, uh, um, talking about the... the uh, the horrible effect this will have on our welfare state, on our jobs, on on the boat is full, we cannot get any more. Look at us, poor Slovenia. We don't have the resources. We have unemployment of our own. So the minute this happens, um, it's an interesting consequence. It's actually, the causality is actually not that the public opinion affects the political and, and policy mm. making, the political discourse and policy making, as people would assume. It's actually the other way around. Research shows that um, depending on the, the uh, um, mainstream or dominant uh, political rec rhetoric um, uh, policies, which means how we um, manage situations, what are the legal um, uh, what are the laws, uh, what, what is the integration and migration policy in a certain uh, country or region, this will actually affect the public opinion much more. Mm -hmm. And I did not even address the question of the media, which is, again, you know, if the media is as it is, again, I will talk about Slovenia, which I know 
uh, um, more and maybe because of the audience, but also this 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 is uh, for other countries as well. So the media, if it is um, sort of a sounding board, if it just repeats what the political discourse is all about. So if it if the media are only repeating what the very small elite of political mm. figures are saying, and if this discourse is actually uh, creating moral panic, um, using uh, racist rhetoric or nationalistic kind of a national interests mm. first, then obviously this will very soon resonate um, in public opinion because, um, and this is maybe later for the discussion, I will just today like to talk a little bit about um, where we are today in terms of migration being completely criminalized. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but uh, one more provocative thing from my side uh, before we, we go back to Professor Heinz, because y you said, well, uh, perhaps, you know, the, the Western countries had had more time in, oh in yes, development. Yes, but do you think that actually it, it can be uh, for, for, let's say, Eastern and Central Eastern part of Europe, that that um, a kind of um, let's say racism will will actually uh, develop through time. I, I'll give an, an answer. We we have a very interesting case, uh, Professor Heinz. You, you you may know know, know it, but uh, we had um, uh, African-born mayor uh, of Piran, which is a very beautiful city on the Slovenian coast, and it was the first black mayor um, in Slovenia. Also in, in this part of, of Europe, I think in Belgium they, they got their first black mayor. It, is, it was a father of a very famous football player. Uh, this is, that's why I know uh, Mr. Kompany uh, some years ago, so many years after Slovenia. And Mr. Bosman, that, that was his name, a um, Ghanaian um, uh, um, doctor, uh, he actually faced no racism uh, during his first um, time. Uh, and then during his second term, no racism. But after his second term, he said, well, now I would probably not have a, a chance uh, to be mayor for the third time mm. because of racism. So it's, it's actually, will racism develop in, in this, this, let's say, eastern parts of, of Europe? I, is this this time problem uh, we have, that we, we will first become even more racist and then think again like the western mm -hmm. people do okay. <laughs> can i just explain what i meant what i meant yeah. was if we look at the um, the nation state and nationalism mm -hmm. which is my specialty but i connect nationalism with racism because nowadays especially with populists today it's mm -hmm. really hard to disentangle um but we if we if we look at um let i will for the sake of the argument speak of the west and let's say the rest, you know, West and East. So we have this kind of um, um, 18th, 19th century development of a nation state. Mm. And, and then we are looking at the historical latecomers mm. such as Slovenia, on the other hand. Um, so it's, it's bound to happen that um, when you look at it, uh, certain processes took a little bit longer mm -hmm. and developed differently. But I say when you put um, nationalism on the table, uh, it's the same modus operandi. So it's, you would have, you just need to look, you would have the same processes. So for me, unfortunately, it is um, no surprise looking at the developments because um, I can observe as, in res as a researcher that mm -hmm. what we are seeing uh, uh, now is actually how the nation states work. And despite globalized wor uh, world we are mm -hmm. living in, despite the fact that <laughs> our lives <laughs> are, are, are governed by, you know, multinational corporations, nation states remain, and that is why nationalism is still important, nation states remain as those kind of our only safeguards, only risk managers mm -hmm. in this world of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So. Here we come to the question of borders, and here we come to the question of, you know, who is there to guarantee the mm -hmm. welfare state? Slovenia yep. is, the nation state is. Who is there to guarantee your human rights? Well, the state is. One state needs to be. We have those supranational entities, um, but that's the problem with people who are stateless and so forth, or the Roma, who do not have a strong state mm -hmm. there to defend their interests. 
in question that you pose regarding racism is obviously, I mean, racism is alive and kicking uh, 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 in, in those parts as well. We can see really worrisome developments uh, uh, in contemporary Europe, across Europe. Um, I, I would argue that you will always have a portion of the population that will, you know, that those kind of races, xenophobic, highly nationalistic, exclusionary, anti-immigrant uh, feelings will resonate really well with them. And now we can see the swelling of this, you mm -hmm. know, usually small number. And this is worrisome. And this we also need to always connect and think in terms of, you know, the era of post-truth, the era of fake news, the era of um, a piece of information being able to spread like wildfire because of the internet, because of the social media. Mm -hmm. And this affects the processes, that's, whereas before you would have a small group of people um, doing something, let's say a group mm -hmm. of racists, and now they are able to immediately connect uh, using the internet, sharing the information, sharing the news, and in fact, a wider range of population because of the echo chambers that mm -hmm. we have. And this is, I'm just turning now to, towards the digitalization. I'm not saying that, you know, the internet is to be blamed, but it, it, it allows us, uh, and we can see in, in a lot of the research, it allows those kind of mm -hmm. populist ideas to spread very fast. Obviously, we need to take a step back and look at the economic, geostrategic mm -hmm. uh, um, reasons for this. Um, so I don't know if I really answered your question because um, I get passionate about those things. Oh, we see, we see it, this. It's yeah. been two years <laughs> since I spoke <laughs> in public and um, <laughs> uh, or in English. Okay, so yeah, you just need stay to stop passionate. Me. <laughs> stay passionate. But I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> go back to to Professor Heinz. Well, uh, I live in Slovenia, so I'm obviously obsessed with with. Uh, with history, um, this is <laughs> one of the national sports here. Uh, uh, one, of the one, one of the one of the fascinating thing in your in your book on open borders is, uh, well, um, you 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 describe the let's say um, evolution or uh, of of uh, the open borders idea, or better to say, that that actually uh, closed borders or really controlled borders is a very uh, recent phenomena. And you you you, d you describe very well how how this this notion of open borders actually existed through uh, through um, millennia of of, of uh, human uh, civilization. So c could you tell us a little bit uh, on that, including the, the let's say the colonial part when when after the colonial um, um, empires collapsed, it was actually uh, easier uh, to come from the former colonies to uh, to uh, let's say to um, metropoli, uh, uh, the immigration wa was was easier uh, back then, and it was actually, let's say, uh, closed or, or, or monitored or, or restricted uh, later. So, uh, could you tell us something about, let's say, this historic perspective? Mm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, first, um, it's important for me to emphasize that um, uh, freedom of movement is, of course, a very old idea. Mm -hmm. You find it with. Seneca and mm -hmm. uh, ancient philosophy, but it's also more recently in, in the Enlightenment tradition. Yep. So it's, uh, I'm referring to Thomas Hobbes, but you could trace uh, Mont Kenya and others who, make it, who explicitly, Mont Kenya at, at some point says like, I couldn't bear the idea of not being able to travel to the last corner of India. And mm -hmm. this was not meant in a colonial spirit. Yeah. So he, he basically makes this argument, how important this is, and this got uh, lost to some extent with Kant and others, mm -hmm. it's sort of like it's more about, in, in particular in Germany, like freedom was more like the freedom of ideas and mm -hmm. academic freedom, which is also very important. So that's that's one thing that's uh, dear to me. And um, more recently, lots of colleagues in the English-speaking world in particular have uh, rediscovered and re-emphasized the idea of freedom of movement <laughs> for all. Um, that's one thing. Then it's interesting, if, if you look at the history of um, global migration control, and I, 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 first of all, I'm totally with Veronica here, so I'm not arguing against states per se. So if you are for no borders, then it's difficult to imagine states. 
because as long as you stay, you have some kind of, co of borders. But I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm for more open borders, mm -hmm. you know, for fairly open borders. That's another term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I sympathize strongly with my more radical friends who are for no borders. <laughs> But thinking about it, I, th I think the, the goal should be more open borders for more and more people. Mm. Um, and yes, uh, global migration control, often people think Europe did it, you know, they started it and then it spread. But there are some scholars who have argued that the British Empire, for example, was pretty open. You know, yeah. travel, I mean, Gandhi, I believe, he didn't need a visa, mm. you know, to travel to South Africa and then to London and uh, also within the French Empire to some extent there was much more mm -hmm. uh, by the way until quite recently people you know we all suffer from this short-term memory thing mm. Senegal, especially politicians but but yeah. Uh, yeah. also other people yeah uh, until the late 70s or early 80s it was fairly easy to to travel to France from Senegal mm. to study uh, tens of thousands of black workers mm -hmm. build those Renaults and others and now it's like a different continent, a different civilization, mm -hmm. something totally different. Same with Mexico. So in my book, I'm going through these various, of course, every border situation is different. So yep. you cannot generalize. But it's important to point out that in some respects, the past was more liberal. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing just to remind uh, ourselves. And so Europe has become a very different place now. And of course, it's wonderful we have like an open borders area in Schengen mm. and that's also I mean I'm old enough to know that this was very different I mean we our own fellow citizens in East Germany had basically had to pass through and that's of course the origin of mm. all of this a militarized border regime directed against unarmed civilians that's pretty recent and now um, these walls are popping up all over the world and are getting more and more sophisticated and so I would argue that the first thing we should do is thinking, I mean, I don't think it's sustainable. <coughs> I don't think it's just, mm -hmm. um, and it's our work, you know? I mean, there are people now, some people were actually killed, you know this. Mm -hmm. Some people were killed in, in Greece, unarmed civilians being killed, coming from, uh, from Arab countries. And uh, so that's basically the moral impetus from which I start. Even though I think it's not just a moral discussion, it's also very much a, a discussion about international law. I mean, one of you mentioned, I mean, these pushbacks. Mm -hmm. This is not a, you know, now this is being discussed as a matter of opinion, but it's actually illegal. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's illegal as long as we are signatories to the Geneva Refugee Con Convention. And now it's, uh, we are getting used to this outrageous, um, Breaches of international law, basically. Yeah. It happens. That would be my argument. So yeah. because it happens in the region. I'm yeah. a moral guy, but I'm I'm actually just in favor of um, a safeguarding one of the building blocks of a liberal world order. Mm -hmm. And without the right to asylum and some kind of refugee law, we are really, really in trouble. Mm -hmm. I would like now uh, to direct the discussion in, into future and later on we, we would open of course uh, the floor also for, for questions uh, in the audience and also via Facebook and, and YouTube uh, where our live streaming is, is, is uh, currently uh, running but, but let us talk a little bit about the concepts on, on, on the future of course based on, on what we are facing uh, right now. Um, uh, Dr. White, y y you said y you want to talk a little bit about the current situation and of course how do you see the perspective of let's say migration um, in the future especially because also new concepts uh, on, on social welfare li like the universal um, uh, basic income for example, they, they actually rely really on, on, the, st on the state system uh, and, and of course Okay, the the the, the um, uh, climate crisis is something which, which nation states or, or or states by themselves cannot solve because it's 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 a global problem. So so it's it's a little bit different. But but however, I mean, uh, still in in our near future, we cannot think uh, um, of a situation without uh, without existing uh, states. So how do you see the the future of of migration? 
I actually, you, you asked me before, is this okay? It is okay, yes. You asked me before also about the current situation with yeah. Afghanistan and Belarus, which I did not really answer. Um, I'm a realistic pessimist. <laughs> That's very Slovenian. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've, I've been researching migration for um, so long that I can see actual trends mm -hmm. um, and that gives me pause and that kind of gives me pause in terms of being mm -hmm. very optimistic. The thing is that the existing legislation, uh, let's talk about the, the right okay. to asylum, right, um, is there and it's a bit outdated and it's a bit, uh, and even this which we do have is not, as you said, is not being um, uh, observed. So I will give you an example. If you are a refugee nowadays, uh, and we can think in terms of um, the you know, global warming, your island sinks. <laughs> you have nowhere to live. The, 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 the Universal Human Rights Declaration um, in Article 13 gives you the right to migrate, but within your country. What if your country is at war or no longer exists? So obviously there's another article which gives the right mm -hmm. to refuge, but somebody needs to offer you the refuge. What is missing is how do you get to there? Even if there is Angela Merkel who says, okay, um, come wir to Germany. Das. Yeah, wir schaffen es. Um, how do you get from Syria, from Afghanistan to Germany? You cannot go to the airport and buy a ticket. Even if you manage to, they will not sell you one. Mm. Um, you cannot go to the embassy. You cannot go and get a visa. So where do you claim asylum? And this is, this is something that a lot of the times people don't consider. They just see mm -hmm. um, re floods, rivers of refugee. This is how you depersonalize the whole issue. You don't talk about specific individual people. You speak of rivers of refugees so they're just numbers and immediately we are desensitized so they can basically come to europe let's say to to a safe place if they i don't know just drop with a parachute mm -hmm. <laughs> um obviously there is a situation of the first safe country which is why we have um I'm bad with numbers, so I wrote them down, but about 86% of world refugees nowadays are hosted in so-called developing countries. So usually they would go to the, to the neighboring yeah. country, obviously. Um, and that is why uh, 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 you would have, Germany you mentioned is, is number five in the world, um, the first uh, uh, countries in terms of how many refugees they are, um, they are hosting our Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, and Uganda, and then you have Germany. This is also something people don't tend to know, and I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so where we are currently is, I think, Europe and the West in general is um, completely ignorant of the reality, mm -hmm. uh, very much uh, um, interested only in... Um, safety for uh, the national populations, which mm -hmm. means for the citizens. Um, and it pays lip service to the fact that people who are prosecuted should be mm -hmm. given asylum. But then we have pr prominent political figures mm -hmm. that say, yes, we will accept, I don't know, what was the number two or 20 that we are willing, that Slovenia is willing to accept from Afghanistan. Which is no, it was actually five. Oh, or yeah. yeah, something like that. Which is, I'm, s I'm sorry, excuse me. That's, um, I don't have words. Um, mm -hmm. We are, Slovenia is one of the members of the NATO. So we were invading the country. Mm -hmm. We were there. We were, you know, obviously we are involved. Um, so that is why I'm not very optimistic. Mm -hmm. I can see trends. And what you described is actually... The data is here, the research is here. Um, we have people uh, who have answers, mm -hmm. um, but those people are not heard and nobody is really interested in facts. I, not nobody, but not a lot of people are interested mm -hmm. in facts. And we are talking about issues that are highly um, 
emotional, emotive. Yeah. I mean, the people have an opinion on this. It's not like they don't have an opinion on migration. Um, they may pause and think, but generally they would know if they are pro or anti. Mm -hmm. And again, if, if we are talking, I think we should just for the sake of clarifying things. Migration is such a broad term. And obviously we have immigrants who are labor migrants, who mm. are students, who are family members who come. We have people who are highly educated, cultural workers, sportsmen. We have no problem naturalizing those people because they benefit us. And we have legal provisions for their easier entry, obviously. Mm. Um, and then we have all those different categories. And one thing I will say, um, I've been thinking a lot about the establishment of Schengen uh, because Schengen means you can travel freely within the Schengen area. And in order to have that, in order to have the few privileged insiders, members, us, in order to be able to do that, you need to close this. You need to fortify the external mm. border. Professor Hans, uh, when you speak about the future, of course, uh, your concept you, you, you're presenting also uh, in your book is an utopia. But but of course, uh, you also claim, and this is uh, this is you, you're not the only one that we actually should think ut utopian, out of the box, actually to to achieve something in in the future. But uh, in, in the current uh, situation, how do you see, let's say, um, um, a more a more um, timely, close, uh, close concept to to actually to, to come uh, to this utopia that that uh, borders would be actually open for for all. Do, do you see how, how do you see the uh, let's say th th this concept? Sh should we actually, as as a let's say international community or, or as the European Union, actually uh, try try to find a system how? to let more people in? Yes, I mean, my publisher first suggested the term realistic utopia, which mm -hmm. has been so overused, mm -hmm. so yeah. also like necessary. <laughs> and also utopia is of course a problematic concept because <laughs> we, we now talk that it's very much a reality yeah. for many people. Yeah. So there's a, that was a bit, a bit of a controversy, but it's, it's catchy. So I said like a necessary utopia, that's, um, that's a good term. And yes, so I think we are fa we do we do not have the you know I'm also claiming to be a realist very much like Veronica, mm -hmm. so we do not have the option of living without migration. Certainly yeah. not Western yeah. Europe, but very few mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. So that's not an option. Mm -hmm. So everybody who says like get I mean, and I'm quoting in one of the chapters I'm yeah. quoting like far right radicals who really really believe they can deport mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people. You know, I think, well, <laughs> have a try. No, it's not uh, easy. I mean, you need to reestablish a fascist regime, basically. No, and so ask, that, that's always a and problem. ask the and ask the industry because the the yeah. economy yeah, as yeah, supports so yeah, supports. Uh, uh, yeah. Too, I'm, I'm saying they are the real problematic uh, utopians. Mm. You know, dreaming of a homogeneous mm -hmm. uh, and that we had this before. And we are Europeans are good at this, and the Germans, uh, first of all. So uh, that's that's not an option. So the option we have is actively shaping various migration futures. And mm -hmm. if people have a problem now in the media, uh, politicians say like, ah, we need to avoid uh, illegal uh, mm -hmm. migration. Yeah, so let's make it legal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's make it legal. And of course, not right away for the whole of Afghanistan, but let's offer, let's think about uh, legal avenues of immigration which we have already, but very narrowly. So mm. I am the co-founder of a place called Academy in Exile. So we do have academics, for mm -hmm. example, from one from Afghanistan and from, uh, of course, Arab countries. And they have their t stories to tell about getting a visa. Mm. But mm. It, it is possible. By the way, we have two Hungarians now <laughs> who no longer can uh, yeah, do yeah. their academic work in one of the uh, European member states. Mm. So this the situation is pretty bad in many mm. places. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that's that's not a very original answer, but I would say like thinking more about legal opportunities. One model is there are lo lots of people who think about how to do this mm -hmm. on, in practical terms after we get a new government maybe in Germany. So 
And as for example, this one idea I like, you know what, I also know, I know people who have paid smugglers, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. From Somalia, from other countries. You wouldn't find many people from certain countries who come to Germany or other places without paying smugglers, and they pay a lot. Mm -hmm. And this is written in the papers, but nobody thinks this through. So mm -hmm. one, one model is, why do not people, I mean, we, don't, we also know the figures, I, I quote some figures in mm -hmm. my book, yeah, yeah. how much it costs, it's getting more expensive. Yeah. With a more with once the borders are sealed, it's getting more expensive, and of course people get out of Mexico to the United States. It's only difficult, and some die on the way. Mm -hmm. And it's a cynical system, and it shows our total lack of fantasy. And people have suggested why not take those sums, like uh, eight thousand dollars, say, for a young Somali mm -hmm. man or woman, and let them deposit that money with the German embassy and give him a ticket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> give him a ticket yeah. and of course do some background checks so that yeah. he's not a jihadi extreme that's the yeah. other thing mm -hmm. uh, because you know now uh, people all these people who say like let's take back control they have no longer a control they don't, they don't know who's coming in and they do come in so why not legalize this why not think about more creative methods and then the idea is like circular migration mm -hmm. so let's uh, let's see like people come in and what, what has, has been mentioned and then see whether they find a job whether the, whether they open up a business Things they do anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these those refugees. If you look what they do nowadays, I mean, most have found some kind of employment, mm -hmm. or they go to school, and they start. But they are indebted mm -hmm. to their smugglers, you know. And that's very. I mean, we don't know much, but talking to these people, you get a sense that that's this problem is with them, mm -hmm. and they cannot build a proper life because they have thousands of euros of, of debt. I have a suggestion for, for the name of this program, Heinz Eins. Yeah, uh, Heinz Eins. And, yeah. and then there's Heinz too next. It's, it's <laughs> for sure, it's for sure be better than Hartz IV. But, uh, but, 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 but okay, no, no, it's... it's uh, I mean, you'd be popular. Yeah, I, I can imagine that. Uh, but but, but uh, to, think, to think a little bit uh, um, uh, further, well... well as you said, there there is of course the the, the, the question of immigration is, is extremely uh, emotional. Also, the the question of emigration in some European countries, like like for example, well Slovenia is perhaps not not as badly um, um, taken by this. But for example, in neighboring Croatia, uh, <coughs> the, the population is actually uh, decreasing because of so many people emigrating the the country, young people, skilled people. So, so it's 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 even more um, emotionalized uh, in th in this uh, regard, and and of course, for example, our economists rely on immigration. Uh, in Slovenia, uh, it 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 happens with, for example, construction workers, mm -hmm. and and uh, and for example, daily care in in uh, partly in uh, nursery homes. So it's it's it's, it's um, we see that we we actually cannot survive without. Without immigration, it is, and I come back to to, to Arpad's uh, opening. Uh, but we, we should have a sort of control. So, so how how to maintain this this control in in a positive sense, uh, Mr. Heinz? Um, I mean, most of the even we have groups like we we will not we, we do not talk about giving up. Co I mean, that's that's this boogeyman, you know, mm -hmm. being quoted so losing control we lost control in a certain sense 2015 mm -hmm. and you know i lived through it because my my other place where i live is uh, near munich mm -hmm. so i remember we mm -hmm. on the radio station so today we're expecting between three to five thousand unknown people <laughs> coming from austria and these were not austrians and was also <laughs> kind of uh, i mean uh, you know let's not let's, let's not make any mistake so it's not that i was not like slightly worried sometimes mm -hmm. It's not that like, oh, they're all welcome. So this was a situation, you know, nobody wants to make this permanent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because of then course. we would have no borders. Uh, but these were de facto no borders for a short mm -hmm. period of time, for all kinds of reasons we, we read about. And all these programs, I mean, like the Heinz One program. <laughs> so these are all ways of maintaining reasonable control. Mm -hmm. Offering legal avenues, there are other models I could quote Heinz Zwei, Drei, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is widely discussed in certain policy circles, not just in Germany but also in other countries. 
And of course, then at some point, the end stage would be giving up control. That's the situation we have within Europe. Mm. You know, so there's no, I mean, they are even, they are not even counted. You know, if somebody comes from Poland or from Slovenia, mm. they're not counted as migrants because it's just one space. Uh, but that's not something I would uh, imagine for the very near future, mm. even though it's worth remembering that Algeria, again, short memory, was a department of the French Republic, yeah. not a colony. Mm -hmm. And Europe made sure in uh, 1957, when the Treaty of Rome was up for signing, that of course Algerians were not included <laughs> in the uh, provisions for freedom of movement, not those Arabs. Yeah. even although they were French. Yeah. So that's like about also about like the racist mm -hmm. origins of the mm -hmm. whole European mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were very clear, I mean, and France was still a, um, a colony at that point. So that's also something worth remembering. And I'm sure Algerians remember. Mm -hmm. They remember, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they were excluded right from the beginning. Even though they were forced to speak French then, they were mm -hmm. considered French. Interesting, uh, but of course, we haven't mentioned a word on, on COVID nineteen, which is fantastic uh, until now. Yeah, but 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 let us speak of, of uh, a crisis which is of course uh, substantially bigger. It's it's the um, climate crisis uh, we're facing, which is probably uh, the biggest challenge of. of uh, of uh, um, of humanity right right now this this will of course or th this has also already triggered a lot of migration and, and uh, of course uh, let's say the perspective is uh, quite pessimistic even even uh, even uh, more pessimistic than than your views uh, uh, doc dr Beitzer. so so um, how to how to actually uh, put this into perspective because the the challenges will be really huge whole regions and, and continents will, will probably be severely affected by by uh, crisis and those are parts of the world which are uh, underdeveloped uh, already so so um, how do you see uh, this um, let's say element of, of our future from the perspective of, of uh, migration mm. yeah I look at migration in terms of um, if we are speaking of, of immigration and in the very first question you asked about the post-colonial states yeah. opening up, I would say that the states, in my view, in terms of historical uh, research as well, they open up if they see a benefit in it. Mm -hmm. So rebuilding their economies after the World War II, let's say. And racism was there the example of Algeria for France, the example of the West Indies and the other former colonies for the for Britain. I mm -hmm. mean, we have, s I mean, in Britain, um, they were not really welcome with open arms. There was a lot of racism and there still is. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, which yeah. is what happens with COVID, you know, yeah, because yeah. I had it, <laughs> so oh. brain fog suddenly. Um, I will get there, sorry. Um, I, yes, what I wanted to say was that um, in, in if, we, if we stick with Europe, if we are looking at Europe, um, there was a trend in terms of migration and integration policy, mm. integration being how, how do we welcome and assimilate, which is a mm -hmm. nasty word, but really even integration nowadays, even though it's defined as a two-way street, it's mostly about they need to adjust mm -hmm. to where they came. Um, so in 1990s already, we can see this shift in terms of policy change towards issues of security um, and issues of um, crisis. So you see this shift from more liberal, liberal open mm -hmm. policies of wel welcoming, well, yes, accepting immigration in terms of we need it for our economies to grow, um, to a shift in terms of more and more migration and migration policy and management of mm. migration is intertwined with criminal law. So we talk about immigration, so criminalization of migration, whereas the sheer act of migrating mm -hmm. 
your right to be a person on, on the move, so your mobility becomes um, criminalized and surely because of your nationality, color of your skin, or because of the country where you were born, you are a symbolic assailant. So already somebody is looking out for you. There's racial profiling, mm -hmm. obviously. And, and, and the Muslims, ever since, I would say, obviously, the 9-11 events, but you know, roughly around that time, have become this quintessential mm -hmm. other uh, uh, that is preemptively um, considered as somebody who's going to commit a crime. Um, uh, you know, possibly a, a terrorist or something like that. So where we are today and what you are asking about about the, the climate change, I would say that what we are seeing with the criminalization of migration, with the, the, the um, building of mm. fences everywhere, every, every day we read in the news somebody else, some other country, some other region is, is putting up a fence to guard their border. And by the way, um, to um, give another argument that confirms your, your um, to give another fact that confirms your argument about um, the centrist and liberal racists, I think you call them, is, you know, I mean, who did put up the razor fence on the border between Croatia and Slovenia? It was not a right wing government, you know, it was left, a central yeah. left government uh, who put up a razor wire fence, who was a temporary obstacle. How many years later we are still... <laughs> and we still, we still have, have stocks because yeah. Slovenia actually uh, awarded some parts of the unused fence now to, I think, yeah. Latvia to build yes. to build a fence uh, on, on Belarus. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, and we are awarding more and more um, power to institutions and entities that before had no connection with mm. uh, th those issues. For example, the Navy or the Customs are now involved in policing mm -hmm. migration, right? So I guess um, it's preparing for what's to come because if we want to preserve our, you know, whether we call it white privilege or Western privilege or, you know, I mean, we live very privileged lives, obviously, and um, I I we cannot ignore the fact that um, a little bit of, of I'm not going to say discomfort, just losing a little bit of comfort um, for us would mean a, a huge change for, for mm. somebody else. And yet we are not willing to do it. Um, so, um, again, I lose my train of thought, but basically it's, it's you know, it, what we are seeing now is I guess something that is going to be really hard to change because it it's it's almost as if it doesn't matter which um, political views um, you have. It's not okay. I'm going to say it like this: it's not only radical right wings and and extreme races that are anti-immigrant. Now it's becoming, um, I dare say, uh, m more and more mainstream to be hesitant. Uh, to even consider mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, you know, people <laughs> under Geneva Convention have the right to asylum. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you do not discuss, um, you do not discuss this right. And yet what we are seeing with pushbacks, I don't know if you are all familiar with pushbacks, um, you know, this is horrendous uh, uh, breach of, of the right to, you know, not mm -hmm. send somebody back uh, to a place where his life may be in danger. Mm. And yet we are complicit. We are doing it. Slovenia is part of it. We are doing it on a daily basis. It's called the game. And, and yet, again, what do we do even if we send, <laughs> send them back, push them back? They keep coming. So it must be that the situation where somebody is fleeing from, it's much, much, much worse. Mm -hmm. And again, one thing that we seldomly consider is it's not an easy decision to leave your home and go. Most people don't do it. The ones who do are very courageous or usually well off because they have the money or they sell everything to pay the smugglers or even to afford a little bit mm -hmm. of the trip. So usually those people are where, you know, not... Okay, I, I digress, but um, one of your questions was... Um, 
you know about what Europe is is doing in terms of welcoming mm. and about the the mm, the employers. So I wanted yeah. I wanted to just briefly comment on that and and then I will stop. What happens in Slovenia, for example, is that um, official policy, which is barely existent if if it is existent in terms of migration policy, is we want um, highly educated, highly educated, highly skilled migrants, and then this. Um, European blue card allows those kind of mm. people to come even from so-called third countries with alleviated uh, mm. procedure. I, I think the last time I could get the number, we had like seven or eight people yeah. with that. Whereas at the same time, we have, um, if you look at the labor market demand, the demand is for low skilled, yeah, construction workers, low paid, yeah the 3d jobs very dirty dangerous degrading jobs nobody wants to do them and yet that does not mean that the migrant population uh, that comes is low educated low skilled no we have people who are engineers people who are you know i don't know have degrees in philosophy who work in construction mm. sites um so that's the the real situation and th and the fact is that as long as as you said um uh, uh, there will be a demand, uh, you know, and as long as there will be, and we know that there mm -hmm. is a possibility to find a job, the problem is that you canalize mm -hmm. um, it also in the gray market, uh, in the black market mm -hmm. economy. So it's in somebody's interest to have those undocumented jobs. Yeah. And that's a worry. That's a worry for the domestic native uh, mm -hmm. workers as well. Uh, my last question goes to Professor Heinz. Uh, we're then open for, for your questions. Uh, but we're, we're looking at Germany, and, and um, the Germans have really good reputation, including you, that y you think a little bit further, that, that for example, w when it comes to, let's say, uh, your um, Heinz Heinz uh, uh, prospect, I mean, you, you would probably be, be really exotic here in Slovenia when it comes to this. But 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 but, yeah, but we see, yeah. But but but, but we see uh, that, for example, there are people in, in Germany, politicians in Germany, who who actually think about this, who 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 actually express uh, and not not only express solidarity towards, for example, people in in Afghanistan who who helped our forces or our our uh, um, system of rebuilding a, um, a nation. So it's 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 really vocal and and. Uh, well, do you see, for example, in Germany, to come back because you, you have elections in, in uh, three weeks, uh, do you see that this, let's say, positive um, and encouraging uh, view will prevail? C can, can you maintain this, let's say, uh, uh, positive thinking when it comes to uh, migration and, 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 and also policies which, which, which could be, let's say, common European in a time? But the stress, <laughs> but the, the stress was on yet. Very, very yeah. views. Um, but I'm certainly not completely alone. So there are a couple of think tanks working on these issues, uh, producing data. Uh, but uh, like like all our societies, it's very much divided. Uh, we are moving away from a consensus, even al although we love consensus in Germany. But it doesn't exist, uh, certainly not on, not on these issues. Uh, that's also why I wrote this you know, more popular book to intervene mm -hmm. in uh, some of these debates. Um, that's one thing. And another layer of discussion in Germany, but all, probably also in France and other countries, is not just, you know, now we are like the good guys mm -hmm. that are saying, yeah, hey, come on. So we need to think about how to respect those international treaties and be humane and so on. But there's another important layer. Um, uh, who do we want to be as Europeans? Mm. You know, so I mean, I'm a professor of political science and I remember in the 90s, we had this discussion about Europe as a normative force, mm. you know, like the better America. And Richard Rorty once said like, Europe, that's like the future America. Mm. But so where's the Statue of Liberty? Uh, where, I mean, then of course there's all this uh, hypocrisy, you know, in the US, but also with us. And we also talk about European values. 
and I th that's I think very important you know not just you know this or that measure and do we accept five Afghans or five thousand mm -hmm. but who do we want to be as a European Union mm -hmm. I think that's the more important debate ultimately because we can certainly differ about I mean you're still better than Austria they said zero mm -hmm. and, yeah, and yeah. this is a particular striking case mm -hmm. of Afghanistan of course mm -hmm. because as you said like we were involved, I mean, maybe not very strongly, but this was all about European values. Mm -hmm. Women's rights, do you remember? Mm -hmm. And now this, those women who were educated, all these NGOs, they are not allowed in, they say mm -hmm. zero. I mean, mm -hmm. and you know, it's not that we are alone on earth. This is being reported mm -hmm. throughout the world in mm -hmm. India. And so that's the Europe we want to be. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's very important, whether we honor our own um, Sunday morning preaches to the world you know we are worse than the u.s i believe they did something mm -hmm. and uh, now also now they accept some if we need in canada they were also, mm -hmm. also involved and, and but saying zero mm -hmm. that's really really outrageous not just because it's harmful for those people who believed in us mm -hmm. but also because we make a complete fool of ourselves and forget europe and european values mm -hmm. people will say like spare us those sermons you know, and not just in Afghanistan, this will be watched throughout the world. And, and also in Europe, and it, it tells a lot of uh, how we would like to treat ourselves, mm. those who are already in, in Europe. So it's, uh, it's, it's probably not a good reason to be, to be optimistic. But, but uh, le let us open now the audience for, for questions, if you have any. It's, it's actually typical Slovenian not to not okay. to uh, ask any questions, but, but we, have, uh, we have one for start. Um. Um, yeah, so it's more of a question that I have uh, when it comes to you, Dr. Heinz. So I did not read your book, but I did my research and have listened and read a few of your interviews. And one term that comes up a lot is uh, the utopic view on migration and the future perspective in Europe. And there's, you also compare this utopic perspective as like a final stage. Now, everything that has been talking about uh, uh, talked about today and also in interviews, it's kind of repetitive um, when it comes to history and the development and what we would like to see in the future in Europe or even in Germany. Um, just to clarify, I'm also a German citizen. So, um, so my question is, realistically speaking, when it comes to what you also mentioned about your, um, when it came to publishing the book, saying realism in uh, the utopic view doesn't make sense to think about this since it's unachievable since history is consistently developing that's my question if it makes sense to keep talking about something that is unachievable especially me speaking from the way i look as a minority and might be the only one in the room so and i have experienced countless count um yeah of discrimination so yeah hearing what you all had to say on the panel i don't know it sounds kind of like a dream that won't come true i mean if you read say um and again I tend to repeat myself because I'm always asked like similar questions so sometimes I'm saying the same things again time and again. I think see I didn't say this one I'm saying now. If you read for example Max Weber or other people in like um, late 19th early 20th century if you had told them that one day there'll be no borders between France and Germany and that we don't not or Thomas Mann writing about uh, civilization and Culture. So, from their perspective, you know, it would have been completely unimaginable that one day we do no longer consider French people as totally alien with their open borders. So that's one thing. And I could also say something about Poles. Poles. 
they were considered, you know, they were basically racialized um, a lot. You know, they were basically considered like white niggers. That's a term invented by the British. And so from this perspective, I, I, I would say like there's some progress, okay? Uh, both at the level of everyday perceptions, uh, interactions, uh, their data on intermarriage, then there's the European Union, which might fall apart sometime soon again. So that's one thing. Never say that anything is totally unachievable. Mm -hmm. But you are right that, you know, there's certainly a perspective like free movement for all across the globe is not something we, we live to see. Okay? That doesn't mean that it's worth, I mean, that's at least what I would claim, worth writing a book about it. Even in particular, since uh, the, the book is full of empirical detail, mm. and I also suggest towards the end, and in d debates like this, practical steps towards more open borders. Mm. And I do not see why this should be in it impossible. That's a ridiculous. I mean, t uh, uh, 1980, tens of thousands of people from Senegal mm. got work visa in, uh, in France, and now it's impossible. So that's, uh, you need to explain me why it's impossible. Uh, in particular, since so many people think about for all these most recent mentions, since we need workforce, there's a lot of international programs for students. I'm teaching students from Nigeria and other places. And that's, that didn't happen 20 years ago, it's happening now. It's called internationalization of academia. And in other areas you can do the same thing. Mm. Um, so the, the impossible part is certainly, you know, this globalization of open borders, you know, a global Schengen, you know, mm. I would agree. But uh, I think it's pretty boring just to, to, to write all the time what's in the papers already. So why not go one step further? And by the way, the much praised Enlightenment tradition did this all the time. Read uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau about Corsica uh, and other things. So I would, I would still defend this intellectual style, you know. Uh, to, and that's, of course, I, you know, I'm not dreaming up a fantasy world in this book. I'm just, that's basically the title. And, but you are perfectly right, people get excited, not so much about open borders. We all want open borders, we have open borders. You, you might be discriminated against, but with a German passport, you enjoy open borders, widely, mostly, you know, as, as far as I can tell. Maybe you have to get some more stupid questions sometimes. And other people don't have these, um, have, have the situation. That's the, that's how I start the book. And, you know, regardless whether you're a Kantian or a Habermas, you know, whatever, this is fundamentally asymmetric and unjust. And I'm only, only calling upon people to please think about the situation. That's it, you know? and uh, nothing else. So I'm not claiming, you know, that we can, uh, some paper wrote like, for guys in favor of tearing down mm -hmm. all the walls and fences right away. That's nonsense, I don't, I didn't write this. Anyway, okay, thanks. Okay, next question, yes, please. As we see, uh, only the ladies dare to ask questions in, in <laughs> Slovenia. Yeah, I like the question and I also always liked when I read uh, one book which, which was saying that actually Hegel was reading newspapers about a Haiti revolution, which yes. was the most inspiring thing that anyone can think of and uh, I think it's very important to uh, talk about this. I just wanted to, I work like a little bit on a project which works with uh, collecting data about the COVID-19 and uh, I specifically work mostly with Brazilian and Venezuelan migrants. But one thing that strikes me most, like from the past year, what we have like um, in the measuring effectiveness of closing borders when it comes to the global problem of pandemics, it actually showed ineffective, like uh, unless we had some island situation or New Zealand scenario. So it is very like, uh, very easy to perceive how countries the easiest thing was to close borders right to react to the pandemics and then 
when it comes to giving some other measures, it was harder to include migrants in vaccination, to include migrants in the health systems, etc. <coughs> so I just wanted to ask the question when we talk about these uh, satyrs, rocks or stones that want to be, uh, how we soften them? Like, uh, can can it be used like some imposed rationalization through media or through um, having more of these kind of panels like accessible to people or discussing? So I don't know. Like, if it's a question for the for all of you. Like, what, how would you soften these people who are not maybe sitting here because they are not interesting of that? And like make a discussion further, which might not be in the very Habermasian, but maybe in some other way. Yeah, that would be my question. Okay. Shall I start? Yeah, mm -hmm. please. I mean, there are basically two things. So first is about like the effectiveness of sealing borders, and that's also an argument I'm making, and there's some debate here. Uh, that's another point, speaking of dreams, you know. So try to close borders completely. It's pre that's pretty utopian. You know, it's, it's very difficult. So we, we only talk about degrees of openness, you know, and I'm in favor of some bit more openness. So we could also put this in such terms. So that's very interesting. COVID-19 is, is for an entire panel. The second thing, I mean, that's close to my heart because I am studied at Frankfurt University with people like Habermas <laughs> and other, you know, rationalists, basically. And now we are facing uh, people, I mean, we've always faced them, but now it's pretty sizable groups, political party, and I was also, I'm, I was, I'm traumatized by one panel I had a couple of years ago with a pretty uh, senior figure from the German Ethics Commission who was like Sartre writes impervious <laughs> to any kind of mm. empirical reasoning. Mm. He just was stubbornly prejudiced and also uh, very emotional mm. all the time. Mm. So not the way people should be if they start talking to each other. And by my, my answer would be, I mean, if you cannot convince people of what you think is right in light of certain democratic values, you have to contain them. You have to strip them of power. Okay, that's again my realism. That's the only way. You can always try, and of course it works. So I have also one or two family members and some neighbors with pretty outrageous views and here on an everyday basis and you can talk mm -hmm. and it helps and I'm also by the way sometimes swayed it's not that uh, I had never changed so I didn't think the way I think today 10 years ago mm -hmm. but um, in the political arena I think get rid of I mean strip people of political power make sure they have no chance to enact laws that's yeah. it. Don't vote for them. Um, that's that will be my my answer. So either convincing people, that's what politics does all the time. Politics takes place in the medium of language. But sometimes you have to I'm not not I'm not talking here about violent means, you know, but making sure that people do not govern you and others. Okay? Short, very short answer. Can I address yeah, this? Yeah. Um I, I agree totally. I would answer in terms of um the macro level and racism as systemic racism and then the micro level day-to-day -day racists and how do you address that um, my experience is that you don't waste your energy on stones like that um, because it's it's an emotional thing so uh, you know you can have heaps and heaps of evidence. They're not open to even consider a position that is different because they are hardcore in their own. But they have their own facts. Oh, yes, yeah, of yeah, course they yeah. do. They, they, and, and you are mistaken and yeah. you are um, deluding you. I, I, anyway, what works is it works if you, uh, this is one thing, you need to have um, systemic steps and measures and tools to um, kind of, you know, lessen and lessen and lessen the power uh, of, you know, let's say racists and so forth. Um, in terms of how do you um, address people, uh, what works really well is personal experience. So 
I will give you an example. Um, in schools, for example, um, you, and this is one of the things, we always talk about the topic of migration without migrants themselves. So um, trying to find people who are not to be re-traumatized re again and again, who are willing to speak of their own experience. And what we did uh, a lot of the times is uh, we go to schools, if they are willing to give us one hour, and we have one migrant, usually one of the unaccompanied minors who are settled in Slovenia. These are kids who are 16, 15 years old. And when they just talk in groups with students, Slovenian students, it you can see a click in some of them, not all of them, but some of them. I, I am 14 now. He was 14 when he had to flee his home alone without anybody. And they can imagine themselves doing it. And, and a lot of the times, because we ask them afterwards to report on this, you know, my view is if you, if you, if you, if you have one of them to start thinking slightly differently, and obviously these are not hardcore racists, but you can see there are some who have those tendencies. Usually you would have probably one or two in a classroom, and if they're very boisterous and, and loud, the rest of the class will kind of go along with them. And this is when it's the, even the classroom dynamics starts shifting. You could see the other students shushing them with their racist comments. Um, so that's good. You don't need to interfere. So that's one of the tactics, I would say. In the long run, I would only focus all of the efforts on you know, young generations because we can see most of them are open-minded a lot more than maybe their parents, not necessarily so, but um, you know, just, just giving people as much experience, first-hand experience, and obviously personal stories always work. If you de depersonalize somebody, if it's not just a number, if it's not just this mass of, you know, especially if you, f if, if you fear this mass of people, these waves uh, of migrants, if you give them face, name, and you realize they listen to the same music as you, they like the same kind of, I don't know, um, you know, um, stuff so this usually it works with hardcore racists i would say definitely some sort of systemic changes and it's um worrying that even the existing legislation oftentimes is not being observed um and the trend is going towards um right now actually i would like to say i'm not um pessimistic per se and forever but uh, for the current situation mm. <laughs> i don't want to well, I'm, I'm from the media. My advice would be uh, consume less media, yeah. <laughs> uh, especially the outlets which pretend to be mm -hmm. to be media. And I think it, this is really uh, the most important thing: is engage with with people, talk talk yeah. to real people, not not via social networks and and, and so on. And, and really, uh, and, and always try to to imagine how you would feel in in a in the position of, of the of the other uh, because this this can be quite quite uh, quite healing but of course y y you address the let's say the media problem within the media and I unfortunately must agree I mean it's it's uh, it's, it's really uh, a problem of course every media wants to do a good job within within the, um, let's say, function it has. Of course, public media uh, like ours uh, has, has a completely different a different position than, than commercial media, which, which have to make uh, mm -hmm. money. But, but it, 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 really, it is really important to, uh, to reconsider the, the role and, and, of course, the, the methods we, we use and, and, and also the, uh, the topics we, we um, uh, address. So, but but uh, it would be a good start if people would really talk to each other more. And then um, I heard a nice story in the media um, about a um, racist guy who was actually converted by his own daughter um, <laughs> via football, of course. And, and uh, he, he, he looked really healed and, and ashamed of, of his, his previous uh, way of communicating with 
with people. So uh, I think there is there is hope. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I think that was it was a good a good end. There is hope, and we got of course the the, the signal to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could see it. <laughs> I would really like to thank you, panelists, and all of you who came today. This is an open letter to Europe. It was published. It was published um, last week by Vecher, and the poet who wrote this open letter to Europe is no other than Dos Grünbein, a German poet, and he's written a letter to Europe. You might, after this, after tonight's discussion, you might really enjoy it. It's, um, he's writing from a different angle, sometimes overlapping with some of the views that you have articulated today. Please feel free to grab a copy. It's been published in four languages already to make it easy for you. Okay. Have a good night. Thank good. you all for coming. Thank you. And don't switch the channel. Stay with the Goethe Institute. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for inviting me.